I was born on July 20th, 1935. My parents were the late Oscar Nicktoon Sr. Kayak is his native name, and the late Cora Tobak. Achna Jack is her real name. Growing up, we hardly stayed in the village because we were nomads. We were always in the camp. There was a place up the Latna River called Signale. We used to fish, seining for whitefish. We had the clearest water river. As little kids, we, used, we learned how to scale. We had that table knife, and then we hold the fish by the head and just start from the tail and scale it all the way up to the, take all the scales off. That was our job as little children when my mom and grandparents cut the fish and smoke it. We had to follow the game. We stay in the camp, sometimes all fall and all winter. Dad had a lot of magazines, so we learn our alphabet and learn how to print from those. We had to come to the village now and then to go to school, catch up on our grades. It took me 16 years to get the eighth grade. It was more about survival in them days. My mom died on giving birth to the twins. Freddie, the first one got born, but in, it was in October, so we couldn't go across the river. The ice was running before it all, all freeze up. We couldn't go to get a nurse, so my Aunt Bessie tried to help her, but in the, the second baby couldn't be born, and she died from that. My oldest sister, Alma, who made my slippers, she claimed me to finish raising me. So I was the caregiver because those days she had to go out and chop wood and check the rabbit snares and her trapping too, and I stayed in the cabin with the children. Thank God we had the Nicktoons, that's Dad's parents. She was such a kind woman that I remember after mom died, she kind of take over. They live in their little round house. They call that sot house. We used to love to go there to eat frozen fish and seal oil. It was early morning, it don't matter. They had some kind of light and then we eat and they put us to bed. But I never forget them, they drum and sing for us. That's the days I could still understand in back language. Western education was so important by then. Dad decided we better go to school and let go of our language because we get spanked in school for it. He said, I don't want nobody to spank my kids. Someday you'll get a job, you need your English. So we learn not to use our language. It's just like losing your identity. All my other older sisters got married and dad needed help with the household I, since he had a younger son and my younger sister, he was a pilot on the river boats and he earned money and he let me be in charge a bit to order groceries and school clothing. And he used to gamble a little bit. He used to say, no matter how much I beg you, don't give it to me, he'll tell me. <laughs> I laugh about that one because dad was so trusting. <laughs> I go hunting for muskrats and I couldn't shoot it. And it got away. I couldn't kill. 
<laughs> That's what he, Dad said that. We got to do something with you. So when I was 16, he sent me to my cousin at Battlesfield to help with her children. That's the first time I ever saw a, a toilet, flushing toilet and running water with sink. I felt like I didn't belong for a while. Yeah. He was doing the best for me, though. And then after I lived with my dad again for two years, I, I went to Mount Etzcom after working three months downtown in the hospital. I saved all my money, and I didn't know BIA was paying my way. And I said, I've got my own ticket to go to Edcom. She said, no, you got to use the one we provide. I said, no, nah, give it to somebody who needs it. I said, I paid paying my way down. And I did. <laughs> my independence, dad taught me that, to be independent. He said, don't, don't depend on the government because you, you got two hands, two feet, a brain. You make your own living. And I stress that all my life. <laughs> we had to learn all the medical terms. And can you believe that? Jumping from grade school to... <laughs> and we had to make a living, so we just jumped right into it. But we had each other to study with. And we study all evening and hardly even sleep and go do the lesson for three months of book training. We had a sergeant from World War uh, II as our teacher on nursing. She's telling us about how they took care of people in the war and everything. After three months of book work, we trained right on the floor at the hospital. A lot of our patients come in with TB and they were older and all they know is their language. And then I was understanding both sides and still. And so that's where we come in handy. We can tell the doctor what they're going through. And then come to find out dad got it. My dad came to the hospital with TB in his lung. And I was his nurse, and my younger sister we were both his nurse when he was healing. He was the proudest man. When I got this letter from the governor, I was so proud. He even congratulated the graduates from the, I think that was the highest honor we got after we graduate. And gratitude for them putting me through training. I worked there for over three years. Yeah, and I got transferred to Anchorage. I start more in the alcohol because it was a bigger city and I was up more on my own. So I tried alcohol there too. And so I just said, no, I can't, I can't take Anchorage. I just quit my job there and I got on the train from Anchorage to Fairbanks with hardly any money in my pocket and my cousin Pauline and her husband, they let me stay there until I can get on my feet at home. I'll get a job, no problem. I still had my license, okay, LPN license, so I went to the Catholic hospital, it was St. Joseph. They said, when can you come to work? I said, when do you need me? How about tomorrow? Okay. I still had all my uniforms, my working shoes, white shoes, white stockings. <laughs> That's what we wore. I had the day off and I went to the bar. I got all dressed up with my red skirt, black sweater and nice shoes. Went to the bar and there he was, <laughs> Richard. Louis Fliegel. <laughs> he went up to me and asked me if I wanted to dance because they had bands in the bars in those days. So we ended up dancing and then he started picking me up 
when they have a day off, and we went from there. He used to work for a daily news miner. He was the typesetter, and he was working there, and I was an LPN at the hospital, and we had it good, because I had my own little place. He had his own. Then I, this is the hard part of my story, because I got pregnant before I met him with somebody being drunk. And so I had the baby at the hospital, and I put it up to adoption. And I quit my job after that, went home. That's the last summer I went fishing with my sister, Alma. I was all grown up, and my husband, he quit his job in town. And so he, he came up and married me in the fall time. Then we spent the winter with Dad. There was no jobs for us in the Latin, so we had to move out Mandy Hutchings. He got a job at the roadhouse to fix it up with a friend. And then he, he met some gold miners, and he started working in the mining camps. And I was the school cook and janitor at the school. So I make my living that way. And so I married and had five children with him. We had a happy marriage and alcohol got involved and then my husband come home and start beating me for nothing. I said, why are you doing this? Sometime he'd be so drunk and, and he put me there in the hospital one time. We split up in 79, but I went back to him until 1982 after my son committed suicide. We just fell apart. I was already out of the house, so um, I left him because I was a uh, domestic violence marriage, so it was very bad. My kids suffer from that still. I hear my kids talking about it yet. I was staying at a shelter keeping my job. My son had already died, and I, st I tried to drown it with alcohol, but I couldn't. So, so I decided to ask for help. So they put me in um, outpatient. My uh, thing was going to alcoholics meetings. I tried many times. I. I go without drinking for years and years, and I always go back. But then when I decide I'm going to try one more time, put him in my life, back in my life, and that's when it worked. He took the whole desire. No matter how much I see people drink, it don't even affect me. He just took the whole thing away when I went up to the altar. And so that's why I have the forgiveness. Without drugs or alcohol, it's the best life ever. Because you wake up sober, you have a clear mind, and you're just happy. <laughs> and it's possible because I went through that. God gave me a loving heart he gave me a living, loving heart. That's why I'm here. And I put my hands up. <laughs> the late Reverend David Salmon kept telling me is, don't give up being an elder. When people ask you to go speak somewhere, do it, he says. And he said, I've got something for you. This is a talking stick I carved in my 90s. He had just finished it. And he said, now you go out and teach our people. Learn also to let stuff go by forgiving. That's why I'm an elder in that classroom. I work with a social workers, rural human services. I teach a lot of students how to be, and they say it's so relaxing and it's 
clears the mind and it takes all your troubles you can give all away, you know. That's why I call it the healing part of my life. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Yee!